458, so we still have two minutes. Oh, nice. So we gotta, you know, shoot the breeze. Where are you from? Uh, where are you from? I'm Aaron Carter. I'm from Sacramento, California. Okay. I'm originally from Stockton. Don't tell too much. You gotta uh, save that. In the okay. so, just where you're from. Uh, where I just want to know from a baby. Corey, where are you from? Sacramento. Sacramento. Eduardo. Where are you from? Fremont, California. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Fremont, California. Testing, testing. Everybody, can everybody hear us? Can yes. you on? Okay, uh -oh. good, good. I am from Santa Fe, New Mexico. That's where I was born. Really? Yes! Isn't that crazy? It's yeah, small town that, of Santa Fe. George R. R. Martin lives there. Oh. Now? Anybody know that? Anybody know that? He and I talked about green chili cheeseburgers no. at a book convention. <laughs> yes! At a book convention. And he loved that I was born and raised there because he lives there. And so when we begin, uh, we'll begin in one minute, um, but before we begin, I always like to tell everybody that um, all the panels that I do, I, I it's such a high, high, high um, on my value scale to make sure that we get your questions answered and get your comments incorporated. We're 100% here for you guys. Am I right? I'm right. speaking for all of you? Yes. Oh, Corey, what was this? Well, 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 who are you here for, if not for the audience? 98%. Oh, I, oh, I, I moved, I moved. This is for one of our guys who's not here right now. Yeah, there we go. Um, okay, so is it mine yet? Oh my gosh, the longest minute ever. This is my daughter, Cora. She's on the back of my phone. She just turned one last month. Oh, there she you go. She is the avatar. She is. She absolutely is. It's spelled C-O-R-A, so technically it's the English spelling of it. But hey, it, it counts. Okay, so here we go. It's fine. We can start. One more round of applause. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you so much for coming. You are joining us for the synergy of film, books, and video games colliding and how those genres are evolving and intertwining. And again, like I mentioned, we're absolutely here for you guys. So if you have a question or if you, for example, hear something that Eduardo or Aaron is saying and you want to hear them uh, elaborate, you can tweet me. I will be checking my Twitter live. You can uh, find me at Janice Davis. Spelled weird with a G. I know, it's like Denise, but with a G. Um, and I'll check it just continually. So that way, if you hear something that you want us to, you know, talk a little bit more about, I can try to incorporate you right into the panel live. So that's that, and uh, we'll start with introductions, and then we'll dive in. You guys ready? Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right. Here we go. Um, so I'll start, and then I'll go down the line and let all of you introduce yourself. I am Janice, like I mentioned, and I'm an author of a video game thriller called The Holder's Dominion. I'm also a host and speaker for conventions like Wizard World and San Diego Comic Con and book conventions and video game conventions. And I also just was asked to start a podcast, which is close to their heart because they're podcast hosts, uh, a video game podcast called The Gamer's Dominion, inspired from my video game novel. So I've been juggling uh, my, my daughter and uh, the podcast and writing and speaking. So that's me in a nutshell, and I'll pass it over to Aaron. Hi, I'm Aaron Carter, or Sir Aaron Carter. Ooh, Sir Aaron Carter. Carter, I like that. So uh, it sounds so uh, uh, royal. Yeah, it's royal. I've been knighted. I like that. Oh, you have been knighted? Yes, yes. Oh, man, we'll have to talk about that afterward. I want to be knighted. <laughs> All right, tell them about yourself. So I'm uh, one of the hosts on the Video Game Bank podcast. Uh, and a writer for nerdreactor.com. Um, and all the time that take it. Yeah, geek culture. Awesome. Round of applause. Round of applause. Eduardo, take it away and tell everybody about yourself. Uh, I'm Eduardo Castillo, and I'm a filmmaker. Was that it? Was that it? I was so fast. I like, looked at my phone for my notes, and all of a sudden he was done. Well, tell us about your, your filmmaking. What was the last film title that you. Uh, well, I've been doing uh, films for a while now. Uh, I've done two feature films where I've written and directed. And so the first one's called The Last Wolf of Ezo, and it's, uh, it's about a samurai that travels to the Old West to hunt down a werewolf. And that is now on DVD, so you can get it on Amazon, Best Buy, wherever you guys buy your product. Um, and then I have another one coming out called Fair Chase, and that's a, it's, it's about these Wall Street type stockbrokers who hunt people for fun. Very cool. Round of applause for Eduardo. Disclosure, this is his first panel. So one more round of applause for Eduardo. First panel. Corey, take it away. My name is Corey Vincent. I host a podcast about video games in Sacramento, California called The Video Game Bang. Woo! 
Uh, and I'm also the NorCal content coordinator for NerdReactor.com, which means that they send me to conventions up and down the countryside, and we get to interview cool people. Awesome! Round of applause for Corey! <laughs> so this topic is so incredible because we all work in these genres, filmmaking and video games and writing with books and comics, and it's amazing to see these genres just pulling from each other. Whoa, that was very hot mic. Pulling from each other and evolving and changing. I mean, we see uh, games with incredible cinematic cutscenes that you, you almost feel like you're in a movie playing video games these days. And, and then of course books, you know, there's so many films based on books and pulling from storylines like that. So it's always cool to get speakers from all these different genres to talk about where they see these genres going and, and uh, how they're evolving and, and the drawbacks as well as uh, the benefits. Because honestly, I think there are pros and cons to these genres pulling from each other and, and working off of each other. So we'll just start uh, with Aaron, because I don't, I don't want to put Eduardo on the hot seat just yet for his first panel. So, so Aaron, can you tell us a little bit about how you've seen the video game industry in particular pull from books or filmmaking specifically? Um, well, one of the ways that I kind of saw in the beginning, and I, I don't want to start off with kind of a negative point, but I mean, this. Hey, here we go. Let's do it. Let's get into it. So in video or in movies, you have um, say you have a trilogy like Lord of the Rings. At the end of Lord of the Rings, the uh, Fellowship of the Ring, you knew there was more coming, so the story wasn't complete. You know, Frodo didn't make it to the you know mountain, and so you expected that. Well, we see that in video games sometimes as well, but we don't always get that guaranteed sequel game. Sometimes it just cuts and it's done. I mean, if you have like Halo 2, that one ends on a cliffhanger kind of, and you have Halo 3 to back it up and take the story up where it left off. So I would like to see video games kind of move away from that. Sure. If they're not guaranteed a you know, trilogy, I guess. Because um, if the sales are poor, then they're just not going to say anything. There was a game on the Xbox, the original Xbox, and it's slip in my mind, but uh, apparently it was supposed to be a trilogy, and it just failed okay. miserably. They even tried to do like a contest to give away a million bucks to play the game and stuff what? like that, and it still just didn't. And, Is that still going on? No, that's done. That's, that's so, so done. Um, but I mean, from the cinematic standpoint, like Hideo, Hideo Kojima and all his Metal Gear games, they just look like movies, of course, you know, he takes those aspects with the cutscenes, with the storytelling, that's the positive I see. Uh, if you go backwards from uh, video games to movies and how video games have influenced movies, um, it's a little less because video games is an interactive media. You know, it's kind of hard to put that into a movie with a whole bunch of people watching a uh, film. I mean, they've tried camera angles, like in the Doom movie. I don't know if anybody's ever seen the Doom movie. They went first show person. Hands, show hands. Anybody okay, seen the Doom movie? So yeah, they went first person. You know? And it was, it was interesting. It was an interesting take to see. I would like to see, and there's another actual, another film that's coming out that's all in first person. And that looks like it's going to be very, uh, well, it's very action driven, like, just like a shooter you know, is. But, um, well, it was interesting what you said about, you said that, that in movies you know that the trilogy is going to leave you yeah. hanging. But yeah. with video games you said that that does happen or doesn't happen? It does. Okay. There, you, you want yeah. to go away from that. Yeah, it should. Cause, so they're, they're very big games, like Mass Effect. Everybody know about the Mass Effect series? At three games, your character continues to grow through. So the decisions you make, people you interact with, uh, how rude or polite you were carried on through all three games. So you knew what I do here is going to affect the next two games. Um, but not all games are like that. So if I'm playing like Sonic the Hedgehog, and then at the end of the game, Dr. Robotnik, or Eggman, whoever you want to call it, uh, decides, you know, I'm going to kidnap Tails, and you got to find out in Sonic 4 until, you know, to see what happens. It's not always guaranteed there's going to be a Sonic 4, you know? Sure. So uh, if they come in, I guess if, if the game comes in with the deal saying, hey, we're going to do three, then yeah, that's fine. But to leave it without 
knowing what happens, it's kind of like an incomplete story. So. And it's interesting too that you know with a book you have a, an ending that you have no control over. The yeah. author writes it, and there it is. With the films, you're a passive audience. Video games, it's the only genre that you can be a part of the story. Right, it's all interactive. So, it, like I said, it's a little more difficult unless it's like choose your own adventure book. Sure. But then it's yeah, video games. You're you're controlling the character. You're walking them through the story, and you're making decisions for them. Uh, as opposed to movies where you just kind of sit back and you enjoy sure. the ride. Edward, can you expand on that? Just to tell us about how you've seen filmmaking colliding with books or pulling from video games or vice versa. Well, I mean, I see a lot of like cross merchandise. You know, I mean, you know, they're always going to make movies based on video games and vice versa. Uh, and same thing with books. You know, I mean, the old saying, you know, how the movie is always better than the book. Right? Yeah. Wait, 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 no! <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like that you said that because it is. It is always the opposite. Where people are always saying, you know, the books that are better. Why? Why is it that you know films sometimes can't get it right? You know, if they're trying to copy, but not copy, but bring to life the book or the video game. As what do you think? I don't know, because I've always felt that the movie was better than the book. Oh, interesting. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I think whenever you read the book, you have your own imagination. And whoever makes the film, they're kind of putting their imagination and their spin on that tale. So, in my mind, if I'm reading a book and the main character is, you know, and they didn't describe the main character as six feet tall or something like that, that's what I'm imagining or something. Sure. But in the film, they could be, you know, a little short, a little taller. You know? like, wait a second. Yeah, that's, that's not, that's not what I meant. So sure. my opinion is going to be biased based on my own imagination. So I'm like, oh, the book was better, definitely. Sure. Um, sure. But he's a filmmaker, right? right. So, yeah. And how interesting that he yeah. that you know, in, in the majority of your opinions, you do like the film versions because yeah. you know that is your. I think what it is is too is I I can see where all the work goes in. You know, I can see, you know, you read a book and it's all from your perspective, and then when I see a movie, I can see the diff, you know, like, the work that the gaffer puts in, the work that the art director puts in, the work that the editor puts in, like, I can see all these different things, and you see all of their imaginations come in into this one art piece. So instead of just, you know, me, you know, taking something and then envisioning something like that, you get so many different minds coming from one piece. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead. Yeah, it's it's Voltron. Every single movie based on the book is Voltron. I mean, Corey, so. Corey, what about you? Um, man, you're so far away. I feel like, ugh, it's too far. Uh, what, what, how have you seen these genres pulling from each other, colliding? I know video games specifically is is in your expertise, and we've seen just tons of media, you know, blowing up from Twitch and YouTube and Machinima. Does anybody does everybody know what Machinima is? Yes. Okay, you guys, gamers. Anybody who doesn't know Machinima are uh, uh, basically cutscenes in in the video game that are like little little small clips of movies. But Corey, go ahead. Tell us about your perspective. I think they allow uh, for a lot of, like Machinima and Twitch and YouTube allow uh, a lot of us, the content consumers, to get involved a little bit more. Uh, like me personally, like, uh, you can start a Twitch channel, have a bunch of people watch you, and you can just throw your own perspective and be funny or whatever, and kind of piggyback off the work other people have done. Uh, and then with... Uh, same thing with Machinima, like, I think some of the work that they put into that, like, you watch dorkly bits and stuff like that, like, they put in just as much work as the game developers and the story writers, so it, it, it allows a whole new genre of mixing and matching and uh, creativity mm -hmm. that a lot of the people who own those IPs can't do themselves. And, you know, you mentioned how it involved, how uh, all of these channels enable us as gamers to be a part of it. And for video games specifically, I have seen just the whole game development change based on things like Kickstarters, because people can become, gamers can become co-developers in a sense. I see you nodding, Aaron. Well, Kickstarter, I don't know, I have like a love-hate relationship with Kickstarter, because for bigger developers, so, um, like Mighty Number no. Nine, the guy who made uh, Mega Man, you know, he had his Kickstarter for the video game Mighty Number no. Nine. But I'm like, he made Mega Man, and does everybody know who Mega Man is? Yeah, so he doesn't really need the money. <laughs> is what I'm saying. Before you know, Joe, independent developer who's making, you know, Hot Man or something like that. You know, he. I'm never playing that game. <laughs> he needs the support of you know people that see that he has a good idea, 
and he wants to execute it, but he doesn't have the, the history of funds like a Mega Man developer. And I see a lot of big companies, you know, doing that. Like they'll like, oh, well, let's do Kickstarter. So it's kind of it feels like they're making the the fans pay for the game kind of twice, you know, yes. as opposed to just you know we're gonna make the game. Put it out. Show of hands, who has backed a Kickstarter project in their lifetime? Yes, look at this. I'm raising my hand because I have two. <coughs> so, about, yeah, that's about half of you say in the audience. But were the, the Kickstarters that you guys supported, were they for major companies or smaller companies? Smaller, raise your hand. Yeah, see, that's good, yeah. Major, raise your hand. Okay, half of them. Now, I understand the, the buzz will be behind stuff like Mighty Number no. 9. You know, like, oh, yeah. From this guy, I want this, but it's just like he has the resources definitely to do this. It's, it's not like he's fresh off the. The big project that I backed was Star Citizen. Anybody heard of Star Citizen? Yes, I've heard yes, yes, awesome. Uh, that I, I've never played a Space Sims game, but I feel like that would be the game that you know draws me in because it's such a huge, persistent universe. It looks like a movie, and Chris Roberts, the developer, he is a filmmaker and a video game developer, and so it's interesting that his vision is to make this game that fuses films and video games that has in-depth cutscenes that makes you feel like you're in 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 the game. But does that are there any drawbacks to that, Corey? Do you feel like sometimes games have too many or is it all pros, cons? What do you think? It's never all pros. Look at Mario the movie or Street Fighter the movie. It was amazing. Little <laughs> combat. <laughs> Well, 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 I love the John Claude Van Damme. <laughs> yes, John Claude Van Damme was amazing, and Mortal Kombat 1 was amazing. Yes. Okay, there we go, Corey. Keep Mortal going. Kombat 2, I was referring to. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're in a man. Yes. I saw that when I was six. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, I know that I love it. I haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah, but, uh, but it, then you get home runs every once in a while. Like, uh, what's one of the better ones? Resident Evil 1, I thought was really good. World, World of Warcraft, Warcraft looks to be the first one. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That looks like that's going to be the first one to actually. Uh, like, I played World of Warcraft for maybe, I don't know, six months. Like, Warcraft players? Warcraft, yes. Warcraft, Warcraft, yes. Warcraft. Yes. Woo. So, and I know everyone's like, oh, you didn't play the game or anything. I spent the majority of my time just looking around the environments and taking screenshots. Like, all my friends know. I was just looking at everything because I was just so amazed by the open world, the different environments. Interesting. Um, and like, I had fun for six months straight just doing that. And I mean, I didn't really need, I didn't play the game like a traditional, you know, World of Warcraft player. But then I saw the movie, or the trailer for the movie, and there's like so many. Yeah, okay. How did you already see the movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Warcraft movie is supposed to come out next year, I believe. In what is it, June or May? Anybody know? I don't know. Sometime next year, right? Sometime next year, okay. 2016. Yeah. But I, all the places that I, I saw, like recognizable places that you know that I explored, and it, it was like they brought those um, those elements in the game. Yeah, those elements, but those like they weren't as detailed in sure. the game, and then they brought them to the screen, and they still held that same like you know, like what's the the I'm slipping on the. the no, the farm place with the, uh, the scarecrow. Uh, I'm so. Any Warcraft players remember the scarecrow zone? No. Westfall. Yeah, in Westfall. Westfall. You can see that in like one of the uh, the small shots in the trailer. And you see like the giant scarecrows that you fight in you know in that area, like in the background. This is like okay, you brought that like really to life. And I don't see a lot of one to one. Movies from either film or video game. Well, right. who's who's producing that movie? Well, I, I'm glad you asked because I know Legendary, and I, I know that the director Duncan Jones played Warcraft for years and years and years. That's the key to the whole thing, right there. I doubt that the guy who made the Mario movie in the '90s played 30 <laughs> seconds. Of Mario Brothers. <laughs> well, it, uh, it was a team, like a husband and a wife. Yeah. Makes any more sense. They wanted to make a passion project for the kid or something. I don't know, but that movie sucked. There's nothing like the game. See, I think. I like that movie. <laughs> Tim Burton and Batman. Tim Burton said he had never even read a comic before. Tim but then why didn't he make the Batman. best Batman movie? Not very. I loved it. Not very. So, so the, the audience members said Tim Burton and Batman, and you liked what he did, even though he didn't write a comic. No, he, I mean, so didn't read a comic. He, he said uh, he was actually poking fun at Kevin Smith because Kevin Smith said, obviously, you've never read a comic. Oh, and interesting. It was true, and I don't but Eduardo, you liked what he did. Yeah. <laughs> so even though he had never 
Never read a comic. I don't even know if that's true. I think he was just making fun of Kevin Smith. Okay. I don't know. We don't, <laughs> we don't know. But, but it is interesting to hear what Aaron said where he said, you know, I, I believe also that in the past video game movies just they've had a bad you know bad go of it and, we, and gamers have, have continually said why are they cheesy or are yeah. they not authentic to the games that we play when will we get you know an Assassin's Creed movie that's you know on point or a World of Warcraft movie uh, Eduardo is a filmmaker have you seen um, got Prince of Persia which seemed to be a legitimate Prince of Persia okay did you enjoy did you Prince of Persia Okay, awesome. Raise it. Prince of Persia. I see a lot of no's going on in the crowd. Um, no. Okay, so so Prince of Persia. But that feels like maybe the first or one of the first movies know. that it felt like an authentic portrayal. Corey or Aaron? Uh, I didn't see it. I I mean, I saw it. I saw it. Arabian guy? Okay. Come on, yeah. it's video games. Really? I kind of had a, the other thing too, we were talking about how movies don't really do video games well. But there's a big stigma in video games how they don't do movies well either. Like the, the movie adaptation of video games are always terrible. E.T. Oh no, exactly. E.T. is a bad one. Even more recently, <laughs> did we get like Wolverine? One that was that was actually good. Was good. It was good when I was drunk, but it's like it's totally the year. That was great. You did like it? Yeah. Of course. Oh, there's a Terminator versus Robocop for Super Nintendo. I spent hours on that game. Yeah, but would you call that a film movie, or is that somebody's imagination? Putting Terminator and Robocop versus each other. That should be a movie. <laughs> That's the thing. Is, is it an adaptation of just a, or is it right. really authentic? I mean, yeah, they do the Aliens versus Predator, though. So, right. so I have a question. Why, why, do we, why do we want uh, our, our video games to be like movies? Why, I mean, why would we want them to be so. Why would we want our movies to be true to the video games? They're two completely different uh, mediums. mediums, and you're. You, if you want the story, if you want to re play Tomb Raider, you want the Tomb Raider story, just play the video game. But if you want a different, uh, like this artistic person, like Tarantino, to do his version of it, you go see it that way. You shouldn't complain sure. about it being different. So that everybody can hear, he's asking, why do we want our movies to be authentic to video games? Well, look at the, even the X-Men movies, why they get so much crap is because those X-Men movies, while they're produced well in top budget films, they're nothing like what we all loved about those characters. There's drama and relationships and backstories that we all fell in love with, and I want to see it embodied on the silver screen. I want to see it done with my favorite actors and with giant million dollar budgets. And then I go and show up, and then it's just you know. Well, I, 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 mean, I think the, 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 the comics. I think for me is to to piggyback off of that one is more as it's not for me to see the exact same thing one to one, it's for the new people. Because when you see a movie is, there'll be millions of people that will go and watch a movie that have never seen the comic book, and they'll take that as gospel. That's what Wolverine does, this is what Cyclops does, so forth. Yeah, yeah before this year, you know, I would go around and tell people my favorite superhero was Daredevil, and I got so much gut, like, what? He sucks, didn't you see that movie? He's Ben Affleck, like, you know, that. I got to, and I love that movie, yeah. I love Ben Affleck. So that's what they'll do. So when, they're, when you expose a story that's, you know, has a whole bunch of uh, history and, and, and lore behind it to a new audience, they don't know anything about all that that happened beforehand, so they're gonna take that right then and there. And it's it's a little, because like my, my niece, she's 13 years old and she loves comic book movies. She doesn't read comic books, but she loves all the superhero movies and, and all that type of stuff. And she constantly asks me questions <laughs> that I have to explain to her. You know, like, oh no, Mystique didn't do that. And that. she's interested in the other side. So I've been kind of showing her, you know, comic books, like, hey, read this one if you want to, you know, get kind of what the original writer wrote. But just remember that this is somebody's, you know, take on this, you know. It's not necessarily bad, it's just, it's their take. Um, so I, my thing, why I would see kind of one for one is not really for me, but for my niece, you know. And I think it, go, it's, it goes back to being really personal. You know, when yeah. you invest in a really good book that really, you know, you relate to on a thousand different levels or a video game. I know personally video games completely changed my life where I, struggled with shyness and I was terrified to be up on stage or, or talk to a group of strangers and it was so crippling I, I couldn't go out at night to walk my dog or go to the grocery wow. store. I was just yeah, I was I was very 
uh, I, I lost trust in the world, I guess is the way I, I say it. And so it's fascinating that a, a genre like video games can help you meet, meet new people and kind of build up your confidence again. And I remember the first time I got on the mic, you know, my voice was shaking, I was so nervous, and all of the gamers in the, in, in the game were like, oh, come on, you know it, you can, you can lead this you know, fight that we've done a thousand times. But if it, if it would have been for those people that you know, rallied behind me that I had been raiding with, never met in person, you know, but I, I had played with on the computer for you know, years and years, I, I wouldn't be able to be here today. So it's, it's incredible that video games can can for me can go from you know I was I was a book lover and then I, I started enjoying video games and then you know movies of course have become a part of my life as well but it's interesting that it when it comes to representing one or the other it's just because it's such a personal experience you know you want that book to be represented on the big screen or you want the, that video game to be to have at least a thread of of, of what you loved about the character characters or, or, or so on. Human nature is kind of weird in, in the way that like when you like something, you will support that thing through whatever, and if it's misrepresented in your opinion, you get just mad, unexplicably mad. Like uh, there was a couple articles I've been writing from Nerd Reactor. I'm, first of all, a huge fan of Fallout, the franchise, and I love Fallout 4, but I want to write an article that said, Here, here's five things I think they could have done better. Here's five things I didn't really care for. And then so many knee-jerk reactions of just like, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. This is the best game of all time. And you obviously never played a video game before and all this stuff. So, yeah. No, I don't really know. Uh, you had a question? Yes. I have a question for you. Yeah. So, you, your friends, the microphone, did they refer to you as Mr. For sure, for sure, and you're absolutely right. So the question that everybody can hear is she asked, did the uh, gaming community that I was gaming with, did they encourage me to go outside into the real world, real world, so to speak, and you know, meet new people when I was struggling you know, with that part of my life? And the answer is yes, they did. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that going to conventions like this or going to big gaming events, we would all you know, talk about you know, meeting up and just celebrating the games that we love. And so, little by little, I, I did do that, and I was able to get back, you know, my uh, uh, my confidence. But it, 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 that's where the idea for the book came: is I wanted to represent gamers in a new, real, authentic way, because there were so many people on my guild or my big shell teammates that would say, "Man, you know, my my, my coworkers—they're always ripping me for playing video games because they think that, you know, I'm." Uh, there's no other hobbies in my life where I don't you know, do anything else. So I thought, well, there's got to be a way to show the other side of the coin. So that's why I wanted to write about video games in a way that, you know, could showcase that part too. So yes, it, it, is, it is interesting that I, that I did have people that encouraged both sides. So yeah, it's good. Any other questions? Your question? Yes. Yeah. I actually just wanted to bring up uh, Avatar, The Last Airbender, to, to film. <laughs> Avatar, The Last Airbender. How, how that went from... You watching the show, and then you watching the movie, going like, "All right, yeah, that's it's a totally different interpretation." Um, I don't like it, but it's nice that they did. But I, I don't think anybody liked that movie. So the question is, uh, how, what do the panelists think about the movie Avatar: The Last Airbender coming from the show to the big screen? Eduardo, you're our filmmaker. Did you happen to see that movie or see the show? I saw it, but I don't remember. Oh. <laughs> uh, Aaron or uh, Corey, do you remember that I think movie? Just in general, anime does not translate well to Western movies because really the culture different. difference. They changed everything. Well, yeah. Aaron, what, what do you think? Do you think there's a chance that with the right filmmaker, though, anime could transfer to the big screen? I, I don't think it even needs to, though. The anime, the people that make anime, and what I really like about anime, they take anime. And they put it in different, they treat it like it's already a, um, I don't know, what, what, so American cartoons, it's either comedy or action, that's it. It's a rare that you'll get maybe a drama or a, um, what is it called, slice of life. With anime, they go over everything, or they, all genres. There's nothing off limit with anime. They have every single <laughs> genre. And it's, it's they, they take it like that's another form of, you know, a media for them to put a story out, and that's, I love it like that. Like, I don't think they need to translate because if they make a movie, an anime, it's like it'll feel like a movie, you know, a Hollywood movie here. It's 
they take that meeting and they, they run with it. Interesting, Perfect. interesting. Yeah. What about people in the audience who are uh, creators, either in, in video games or film or books, or perhaps they're in college or thinking about you know pursuing one of these genres, books, video games, film, in this day and age, with all of the transmedia, right? I mean, you, with with, with uh, video games, you have uh, animated shorts and books and lore and films, and just, there's just so many branching medias. Do people now need to study all of these genres to be a creator, or can they focus on you know one or the other? What is your guys' opinions on aspiring creators in the audience who want to go into one of these but maybe can't tackle all three, or, or maybe they have to? Eduardo, what do you think? Um, I think you just need to pay attention to what you like okay. because it could, you never know what can inspire you. I mean, whether it's like playing a video game or watching a movie, that can inspire you to write a certain type of book. Or if you're already writing a book and you watch a film, you're like, oh, that's such a cool character, like that would work perfectly in my story. You know, you, you just never know where it's going to come from, no matter what, even in real life, if you meet, you know, like the driver on your school bus or something like that. like. That could influence anything that you Sure, do. absolutely. Yeah. Eric, what do you think? Um, I wouldn't say take my path, which is, because when I think of a story, I kind of, all different genres, video games, cartoons, movies, see how it would fit in those. Um, I would probably say focus on one medium. Like, if you wanted to make cartoons, you know, try to lock that one down, you know, master as much as you can. Uh, and then, you know, dabble in filmmaking, you know, because they're very different when it comes to developing. I took uh, classes to be an animator and thinking, you know, I write stories, I like cartoons, I'm going to be an animator. Then I sat down for eight hours in front of a computer and I was like, I don't like, I don't like <laughs> I don't this at yeah. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is not uh, moving little, you know, frame by frame, you know. But as, as a novelist, I have been asked now to write video game lore and backstory and zones and environments. So is it, uh, and I, I don't want to exclude Corey too, so Corey, jump in okay. if you also have anything to add. But it, So I feel I feel pressure now to just go and start, okay, well I've, I've been a novelist so far, but now I'm being asked to write for video games, which is very focused on dialogue and you know very sh much shorter uh, uh, amounts of time to write. So how how would I go from there? I think what you're doing though is you're writing. That's yeah. Like, you're, Janice Davis is a brilliant writer, so you could write. I'm sure the phone book. You know, if you needed to, you could write. Uh, asking, putting a camera in your hands and telling you to shoot a film would be yeah quite different. Sure. So I think as long as you're doing what your passion is and it plays to your strengths, and it's something you want to do, because man, life is hard. If I've learned anything, getting a job, working eight hours, turning into a zombie, uh, getting free time is rare, and then when you do, you want to do something you love. And if what you love correlates to something that might get you into the field of your dreams, <laughs> where you're not a zombie for eight hours a day, that's what you do. Like for me, it was podcasting. When you start podcasting, and it started doing well, and then I started wanting to break out and then do more films. Hey, let's do a YouTube, and let's do a Twitch. And then I got my eggs in so many different baskets, I lost track of what my true passion and heart was, and that was in podcasting. So we recently had to axe a few different little projects so that we could get back to focus. And that's how you make it. Because so many people do what you do better than you. Sorry. Man, it's so harsh. It's just no, like, like, whatever, you, whatever you do, there's a, a Japanese boy that has a... <laughs> A YouTube channel that's doing it better. Well, you know, but it's interesting because you know uh, you you did mention that uh, see a need, fill a need. You know that that's the quote that I love. If you see something out there that you that you want more representation of, like I really wanted to showcase more female gamers because you know I didn't I, I didn't meet that many of them. And well, this was back in 2002 when when they were when we were less vocal about gaming. Um, but I wanted to to put a spotlight on that. So I think that helps narrow down the focus on working in these genres. Eduardo, if you have anything to add, I think this woman in the blue hair, you told me someone had a yeah, question. Yeah, she has a question. Oh, but she's, she's, she's reading something. Okay, Eduardo, what are your thoughts? Eduardo. On? On uh, 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 which genres you should focus on as a creator. Um, what makes you happy? I mean, because it doesn't, they're, they're all. Oh, now you want to stop. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a question? Oculus and Vive and Fur 
first-person actual gaming, and then with Squadron 42 and Star Citizen, and then recently released Until Dawn for PS4, do you see the genre of video games and Telltale games being so popular now, of just cinematic gaming experiences becoming into like the artistic life that movies are? Do you see it? So the question that everybody can hear is he he mentioned Oculus. Uh, so virtual reality, augmented reality, um, games that are incorporating tons of cinematics. I'm trying to remember everything that you said. You mentioned Until Dawn, Star Citizen, um, and your question is, where will VR take this? Well, do you think that video games are being raised to that higher level of artistic? Oh, okay, just, are video yeah. games being raised to that higher level of an artistic yeah. achievement? Yeah. Corey, I see you nodding. Yeah. Oh yeah, look at the. You can just tell Hollywood and major companies don't put money into things that aren't going to be massive. So when you look at the budget for GTA 5, the video game, they put, that was a movie and a book and a video game wrapped into one giant billion dollar package, I'm sure. But how much money Microsoft threw into the most recent Halo, they're being held up to super high standards. Video games aren't what they used to be. They're a major media at this point. And they're, they're just climbing the charts. I mean, they're making more money than books and movies, and so it's it's interesting More that Chris so. Roberts is a filmmaker who's also a video game developer. So I absolutely agree. I think that video games are going to continue to uh, push the technology level. Aaron, Eduardo. Well, I think uh, even you know in video games. I mean, yeah, they're they're going places we don't even know yet. You know, with just the virtual reality or anything like that. But then you also have there's always going to be like the little guy. You know, the little independent guys who go and make. You know, just the nice little games you can play on Steam or anything like that, and you you get a fill of both. You know, it's I think there's something for everyone. You know? um, I don't think VR is really gonna explode. Get out of here. Really? <laughs> 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 uh, only because That's it's right. <laughs> only because it's uh, it seems like the business standpoint, you have to buy the system. They buy the VR as well, unless they bundled in the package. And they bundled things that weren't necessary for the game in packages, and they didn't really make it for a big seller connect. Um, and I, I see VR, or like Oculus specifically, more for things um, like sports. So, or for panels like this. Say somebody was in Russia. They couldn't come here today. But they wanted to be here to see the panel. And we set up a camera here, and they just throw in their Oculus Rift. They're here now, front row seat, but they're all the way in Russia. Or if you want to go watch uh, a football game, basketball game, or what have you, or World Cup or something, something like that, yeah, something you never get to go to. Or you want to go to E3, you throw in your Oculus Rift, and you can shoot around to different cameras, look around the show floor, look over the player's shoulder or something like that, you know, but you don't have to be there. So I see it more, I see it taking kind of that approach maybe, but when it comes to video game, it'll be, I think, a niche thing where it'll come and it'll kind of go. Yes. Yes. Yeah, 
I'm not saying that everybody can't you know, throw on the Oculus Rift, but it just doesn't seem as inviting and to, to was... develop like that, you know, uh, video games like that. It'd be amazing. I would love to play Fallout 4 like that. You know, just all the first person walking around, looking around the, the whole, you know, waste and everything. Um, but I can definitely, I mean, I 100% see it as uh, a giant TV and I'm in a small apartment, you know. And another panelist agreed with Aaron and said that he believes that virtual reality will actually be bigger in other markets besides video games. For music example, he said, you know, imagine being able to open an album album, oh, man, I can't speak today, and your favorite, you know, uh, avatar, you know, your favorite band member pops up as an avatar, and you're able to have a conversation with him or her. Oh, that's a reality. Uh, uh, Is that what you're talking about? No, no, virtual reality, where, you're, where, where you can, uh, you know, be in the space, oh, okay, yes, yes. and then, like you were saying, you can go to a concert, even if you're not at the concert, you can feel like you're standing with all of the crowd, because they have a camera right there. Yeah. But he said that augmented reality is where he thinks video games will That's take. what I think video because, games Because, like, Ingress, I don't know if any of you guys have played Ingress, but it's this video game that has you go to real-life places for quest completion and to unlock things. So you go to Starbucks, or you go to, you know, Target, and uh, you're actually there in person on your on your phone. Like Pokemon. Pokemon yeah, Go. Everybody saw Pokemon Go. What? I mean, it's going to be a whole bunch of people downloading that app whenever that comes out. I'm not even the biggest Pokemon fan, and I know I'm going to play that one, definitely. Uh, you have a question? Yeah. It has to do with the frame rates, and the technology is just not there yet. Some people are onto it, and it's going to be super expensive when it is right. Interesting. Does, oh, is there a question? Uh, I, was going to ask I think Eduardo. I just, oh, what? No, I wanted to ask it, Eduardo, like for, you know about the Oculus Rift, right? No. So it's, it's just made virtual reality, so you can look around, you know, with glasses on. Do you think that if something like that was integrated into films, would that take away from the story of what you're trying to show the audience? Like if I'm sitting and watching one of your films, but I can look around at what's going on, you know. That's such a great question. How, as a filmmaker, could you push a story forward with VR if the audience can turn yeah, away from yeah. the story that it you're trying to tell? Yeah. Kick their ass. I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's one of those things where because we're not there yet, like I wouldn't I wouldn't even know where to begin with it. Like, I mean, it'd be kind of cool with like, you know, like Pixar type films and things like that, you know, these cartoon films, but like real life films, like, I don't even know. I saw your hand and then your hand. Go ahead. So, well, I was asking about uh, virtual reality. There's so much, uh, if you ever play like Grand Theft Auto, it's so immersive, you can go off and do so many things. Uh, Telling the story is about hiding things that you don't want the audience to see and pulling them along. Uh, 
the story, if you give them so many things that can distract them, it would take away from them. So the comment is, in Grand, Grand Theft Auto, you can go all these different ways, yeah. um, and it's almost too distracting. Yeah, and I, I mean, I played uh, Oblivion, and I still haven't I have to finish it. He's so playing Oblivion, still hasn't beat it, because there's so many branching storylines. I agree, I think it's no problem. Sorry, like when you kind of think it, um, you know what it reminded me of, like those, like, like that Terminator ride. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think it would be kind of like that. Like, I don't think it would be like a full movie, but I think it, they would be like theme park movies. Like, you know, and I'm all for that. Totally, totally. Yeah. Did you have a hand? Well, yeah, we're talking about VR, but have you seen those little videos with the three 60 degrees? Like, you can turn. Like, I see them on Facebook all the time. Right. Like, there was a Star Wars one where you're on some type of like speeder bike. And you're like going through a desert, but you can actually like move and see it. Do you think that they'll use that along the lines of movies, but like, because you were talking about the first person movie. Yeah. So now if you imagine that, and then if you could see an alley or a street in New York City in this movie. Like, it's, it's so the question is, Aaron, what I'm thinking here is, do you think movies will have the 360 degree camera in the future so that you can look around? I, I think it's great for filmmakers like, like him, because I have to watch a movie like four times. Because I'd be off looking someplace else, but you had something going on over here, so that means I have to watch it again and not look that's at my true. left. That's yeah. what happens. Oh, there's a game world we call it replayability. Like yeah. a game that's so good and gives you so many options that you, you need to play it multiple times to see everything. And I think that's it would only benefit the movies because me, if I'm watching your film, I'm going to look where you want me to. You know, if you're just a good filmmaker, yeah. I'll, I will look at the conversations I need to, but then I'll want to go back two or three times. To see, like, what was this guy doing? Because now that I know, I want to see this, this guy knew the whole time that he's the killer. You know, before, I think it, Before, oh, go ahead. No, I'm not. Uh, okay. <laughs> before we run out of time, uh, I think I saw a hand over here, so let me know if I missed your hand. But before we run out of time, can you tell everybody, all, all of you, uh, where you'll be this weekend? Like, if you have a booth, like Eduardo, I think you have a booth. Yeah, um, it's and then, uh, so, so, Corey, let's start with you, and make sure to mention your panel and your website and all, all that good stuff. So immediately following this panel, uh, Janice Davis, the lovely author of The Holders of the will be joining us for our show, where we'll get to call the shots. Yes! And uh, I will not let Aaron talk near as much as he did this one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then uh, we'll just be roaming around all weekend, having some fun, shooting some videos, uh, and look out for us if you want to do some funny things. And where can we find you? What websites? You can find us on videogamebank.com, nerdreactor.com slash videogamebank, twitter.com at videogamebank, facebook.com, videogamebankbank. Google search. Eduardo, <laughs> Google uh, you have a booth in Artist Alley? Yeah, I'll be in the Artist Alley, and then I have a panel tomorrow at 4.30 in this exact room. Oh, awesome. So we're showing, and uh, you're, okay. Yeah, showing just uh, for my next film. It's going to be like the trailer premiere, and then we show it. Uh, Yay! Uh, what time is that? 4.30. The film's called Fair Chase. So if you look in your pamphlet, your program, yeah, you'll see Fair Chase panel, trailer thing. I, I haven't looked at it. Yeah, it'll be tomorrow in this room. Awesome. And your website? No. I have one. I just don't know it. And I mean, I show them your cell phone. I, yeah. I don't have that either. Oh, man. I don't have Twitter. I don't have. Yeah. All right, so. and part of your job this weekend is by the end of the weekend, you get your website and your Twitter so that we can promote it. No, I mean, it. I have a website if you search oh. me on I think the it's internet. Hard. That's my I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> He's yeah, mysterious. We don't know these things. If mysteries. you come to my booth in the Artist Alley, I'll have uh, posters, business cards, and things like that. That will have the website on it. And then I should have some stuff tomorrow for the panel too. Awesome. Uh, Aaron, how can people find you? Search. Uh, <laughs> Facebook, Sir Aaron. Sir yeah. Aaron Carter. Actually, if you do Google search that, you do come up with it. There we go. I still want to be mad at you. There's another Aaron Carter out there we will not speak of. Do not speak of the other Aaron Carter. That's forbidden. Yes. Uh, but no, on the video game bank, week in, week out, uh, with Koi. We're going to do the panel, of course, right now. Sure. We're doing a lot of giveaways, too. Just to and I'll yeah. be uh, signing my books. I'm in Artist Alley as well in Row D. So if you like video games or thrillers, please check out The Holder's Dominion. Uh, I had a fight for that book. The publishers wanted to change the protagonist to a male instead of a female. I had to fight for her to say female. They wanted me to hide my name. And wanted me to use my initials because they didn't want anyone to know I was a female writer writing about video games. So the publishing industry has a while, has a wow. has a while to catch it's up. Still to like that? Yes, yes. Uh, they, they need to catch up a little.
little bit. They, they think there's more male gamers than women, but not true. Not true. But I'm representing the female gamer. And uh, I have tons of panels this weekend on uh, villains and female superheroes and creating worlds and just all kinds of panels. So please join us for that. So let's give a huge round of applause for you guys and for my panelists. Thank you.